Welcome to Peak Worship. We're so excited that you decided to join us today. Pastor Alma has a great word for you today, and we're believing and praying that it's going to change your life. How is everyone doing this morning? Listen, listen, we just had a powerful worship service this morning. You, the power of God, the presence of God was in this place. It's still in this place, but we need some excitement. We need some excitement in our lives. And if, if you didn't have any excitement this week, I'm glad you came to peak worship because worship was off the chain, okay? Because God shows up in our worship service, amen? And he kind of sets it up for the word to unfold. Um, when there's a word that needs to be delivered, he sets it up through worship. So anyways, I'm glad that you're in the house this morning. And I don't take it lightly at all um, when Dan asked me to, to minister because I love his word. I love to read his word. It... it, it you see the man in the pages when you read it. When you, when you don't just read the word as, as letters on a page and you see the man in the pages, I'm telling you, his word transforms your life. And I love it. I so was I, digging in Daniel and the Lord led me to a very specific passage, passage in Daniel. And we're going to go to it right now. If everyone has their Bible, which you should know by now that we are peak worship and we are Bible believing people and we read our words. So if you don't have your Bible, take up your Bible app. If you have a Bible app, take it out. We're going to read our word this morning. If you did not bring your Bible, we are so nice to project it for you on the screens so you can follow with me. Um, in the book of Daniel chapter 5, verse 17 through 31, and I'm going to read from the New King James Version. It says, then Daniel... Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God of Nebuchadnezzar, your father a kingdom and, man, and majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took him glory. They took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beast and his dwelling, his dwelling was like the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of God and appoints over it, over it whomever he chooses. I mean, we could stop right there talking about God appoints kings and queens and dethrones. But let's move on to verse 22. But you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this, and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were set, were sent from him and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that it was written. I'm going to do my best to, to pronounce these words. Mene, uh, mene, tekel, apshurin. This is the inter interpretation of each word. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the, Mede, the Meds and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, Belshazzar came of the Chaldeans, king of the Chaldeans, was slain and Darius and Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Let's pray before we get started. Father, we thank you this morning, God, because you are faithful and you're just, God, to, to be an on-time God, to meet us exactly where, where we're at in life, Lord God, that the word of God does not return back void, Lord God, so it, it can be applied to every area of our lives, Lord. So I pray, God, over every, every person in this room, God, every heart, God, that, that they're receptive, God, to what your word, what your spirit is saying this morning. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Speak through me in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So let me just recap what, I'm going to give you the backstory of what I read. Because there's a backstory that I did not read just for time's sake. There's this king named Belshazzar. And he decides to have a feast. 
And when he, when he goes to have the feast, he calls all the wives, all the concubines, all the nobles of the city to come feast with him. And not only does he come feast in, this, in his kingship, he calls for all the, the chalices, the, the urns or the cups that were used in the temple. He, calls, he orders them and he said, bring them inside, let's feast with them. They pour wine into them and they practically desecrate these, these urns or these, um, va- these um, cups in layman terms. And while they're feasting, they're worshiping other gods. And the Bible says that they're worshiping gods of wood, stone. Um, it talks about other, other, things, other things that they're worshiping, gods of silver, gold, bronze, and iron. So they're worshiping other gods besides the God of heaven. And suddenly, suddenly, on the wall, wherever they're feasting in this room, let's just say they're in this big room, on the wall, there's an inscription on the wall with an embodied hand. Now, I don't know if you guys read your Bibles, but the Bible is so good. Like, there's creepy things that have happened. And, and, and God is talking to man through, through incidents and events that, happen in the, that have happened in the Bible. There is a literal hand on the wall inscripting some type of um, message. And so all these people are... High as a kite, they're drunk, and they're seeing, it's not just one account, the one person seeing this. They're, the whole people, all the people, they're watching this inscription. And they're wondering, what in the world is this? What is this hand? A hand without a body. Just envision a hand writing on the wall. And they're all frantic, trying to figure out what is going on. Well, he calls for all the astrologers, all the fortune tellers, all the people that can possibly give the interpretation of this message because this message says something and none of his people can interpret what it is that's written on this wall. None of them. These are people with high rankings in his kingdom. They cannot interpret anything that's written on this wall. Well, what, there's a queen in the kingdom. There's always a woman in the picture. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> there's a queen in the kingdom that says, wait a minute, Belshazzar, wait a minute. There's, there's a man named Daniel in your kingdom that your grandfather or your ancestors appointed him to, in, to interpret dreams, to inter, interpret enigmas, different types of things. Go get him. He's in your kingdom. Go get him. He can interpret. So, so Belshazzar goes and gets Daniel. And they bring him before this inscript, inscripted wall. And Daniel says, Yeah, I can interpret it. And the king says, hurry, interpret it because I don't know what it says. And if you can interpret it, I will provide you a a royal robe, a purple one meant royalty. I will give you a royal robe. And it also meant like political ranking. He'd have have more ranking in the kingdom. And I'll also provide you a gold necklace. And if you can do this, if you can interpret this, I will provide you that. And Daniel said, don't worry about that. I don't need the royal robe. I don't need the golden necklace. I'll interpret it for you. Daniel interprets the message. And what the king did right after, um, um, right, right after he interpreted the message, the, what the king did was, okay, here's your, here's your royal robe and here's your necklace. Now, I don't know if you paid attention, but the message on the wall said, let me read it to you real quick. God has numbered your kingdom. He's talking to the king. He's, in, he's um, interpreting the message. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the other people in the land. And Belshazzar immediately said, okay, here's your robe and here's your necklace. I don't think he realized that this was a death sentence for him. He was about to be done with his kingship. And so I, th- I, I just think it's amazing that, that there was no, um, there, there, there wasn't a thought. Could this be true? Could this, well, what do you mean? What do you mean that my kingdom is finished? No, he didn't even worry about the message. He, all he said, here, Daniel, here's your robe and here's your necklace. And I, I think it's interesting because Belsh- David tells Belshazzar, he tells him, listen, your father did the same thing that you have just done. You have dishonored God. You have been unrighteous before the God of heaven. And you're repeating everything 
that your father did. Have you not learned from history? Like, have you heard that saying, shame on us, if we don't look to history, we're, we're, we're bound to repeat it. Right. We need to learn from history. Belshazzar chose not to heed history and was walking in the same footsteps as his father or ancestors. I don't want to say his father because in, in the Chaldean language, it says that the word father really didn't mean your, my, my literal father. It could have been an ancestor. So he was just following in his ancestors' footsteps. And so <clears throat> I think it's interesting to note that many of us, we have a tendency to fall in uh, pray to what we've seen happen in our families. They're called generational curses, especially if they've, they've impacted you on a, at a negative level. Um, we have a tendency to own fear if our parents had fear or if our grandparents had fear. We tend to, we have a, we have a tendency to own anxiety because we saw mom have anxiety attacks. We have a tendency to have addictions Addictions, and this is not just drug addictions. There can be a slew of addictions. But just because our ancestors went through it, it doesn't mean that we have to go through it. The Bible doesn't say that we have to go through that. And even negative, this is one of my, my pet peeves, negative thinking. I cannot stand a negative speaker. Like when you, not speaker, but when you're talking and you're so negative, I guess uh, being so pessimistic. I, that's one of my pet peeves. Like, can't we just bring some joy to the Lord? Like, can we say something positive about what God can do and not about our circumstances? We have seen in our, in our lineage, in our parents, in our grandparents, in our aunts and uncles, maybe we've seen where people have been just negative speakers and we think negative. So we, we take on that trait. That's what Belshazzar did. He was just walking in his parent, in his dad or ancestors, um, ways of doing life. They dishonored God. You know, some of us are in this place and maybe we've seen divorce. Maybe we've seen divorce in our parents and our grandparents and our aunts and uncles. You don't have to submit to divorce. You have to say that that stops today. That doesn't go past into my generations. The Bible says that sometimes sin passes from generation to generation. But as, as believers, as the Holy Spirit has been deposited within us, we have the authority to say that stops today. That will not follow my children's children and my children's children. Because the Bible says that it will follow your children's 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 children. I mean, it's biblical, but, but because we know God and we're going to choose to honor God and we're going to say no divorce stops here no addiction stops here anxiety stops here fear stops here you have to make a choice that that generational court curse doesn't go past that lineage like it stops here if I had the spirit of of jealousy I, I am a testimony of being delivered of being jealous and my husband can share that with you one day and I think I've shared that before before in our in our women's ministry the Lord has delivered me, but because I saw it somewhere growing up, it's behavioral. Yes. It's behavioral. And, but I lived it, and then it, and then it became a spiritual, a spiritual uh, chain on me, a, a bondage. But you have to break it in the name of Jesus. My son will not have the spirit of jealousy. He will not be possessive. He's going to be confident in who he is. See, to these things, we have to say it stops here. You have to choose to say that it stops here in the name of Jesus. So, um, so you have to, you have to not see it as yours because if you feed it, it will grow. You feed something, it will grow. Um, Belshazzar repeated everything his father did. And even, um, um, he, he never took the point when the inscription part was on the wall. He thought, he didn't think twice about it. He was so worried about giving his, his riches to Daniel. And we just have to break up with the curses over our lives because they're curses they're curses it was a curse that was passed down to Belshazzar but he chose to inherit it and live it out so we have to break up with those curses over our lives and the enemy would like it more than for us to live out a curse in our lives because he knows that if we we bow down to a curse then we'll never make we'll never yield to God honoring lives we'll never yield to righteous living but I'm getting ahead of myself so anyways we have to heed the voice of God or heed what's happened in history before the writing of the wall, on the wall. 
See, the writing on the wall for Belshazzar wasn't a warning. It was, this is your death sentence. It wasn't a place where I'm giving you one more warning and we're done. No, it was a death sentence for him because he did not heed um, the history that had happened before him or the, vo the voice of God. And there was no repentance. There was no remorse. There was no worry or there was no, are you sure that's what that says? And I, I just think it's amazing because we, we, I think that's, that's a story for a lot of people. Humanity tends to do what they repeat, right. what they see. Right. They do what they've learned. And unless God is ministering to you to tell you this is not for you, then you will repeat it and, you, and it'll follow you from generation to generation. But um, Belshazzar knew his father's ruins. He wasn't naive to that. Da Daniel reminded him, you've known this, but you've chose You've chosen to um, um, dismiss the voice of God. And he's dis he dishonored God in unrighteousness and didn't have mercy for the poor. That was one thing that Daniel told Belshazzar's ancestor was, break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. And Nebuchadnezzar, his ancestor, chose not to do that. And, and, and Belshazzar decided to not heed the voice and dishonor God in his doing, in his kingship. So... So we're going we're gonna to camp out right here for a little bit. Um, I think that the reason why Belshazzar did not live a life, of dis, uh, a life of honoring God is because he didn't fear God. You notice his response when Daniel gave him his death sentence. There was no remorse. He did not fear God. He did not fear God. And, and I think that it's important to notice that Listen, you need to fear God. You need to fear God. There's a couple in my life that when I met them, they teach their children, they need to know the fear of God. I put the fear of God in them. I put the fear of God in them. But there's a healthy fear and there's an unhealthy fear. But listen, the Bible says, fear the Lord your God. Fear him. Fear him. In the message, in the message Bible, uh, I'm going to read a few scriptures that says, Psalms 128, 1 through 4. All you who fear God, how blessed you are. How happily you walk on his smooth, straight road. You worked hard and deserve all you've got coming. Enjoy the blessing. Revel in the goodness. Your wife will bear children as a vine bears grapes. Your household lush as a vineyard. The children around your table as fresh and promising as young olive shoots. Stand in awe of God's yes. Oh, how he blesses the one who fears God. Proverbs 10, 27, the fear of God expands your life. A wicked life is a puny life, a small life. Fear of God is life itself, a full life and serene, serene, no nasty surprises. The payoff for meekness and fear of God is plenty and honor and a satisfying life. And Proverbs 28, 14, um, I got from a different version well, I'll read it from here as you can, so you can, since it's in front of you. A tender-hearted person lives a blessed life. A hard-hearted hard -hearted person lives a hard life. I got another version that I, that I loved as well. It says, how blessed is a man who fears always, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. When you, when you harden your heart, when you get pride within you, you fall into calamity. I think that that was one of the reasons why Belshazzar, followed in his father's footsteps because they had a lack of honor towards God, a lack of fear towards God. And there's a man named Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles that the Bible talks about that in, in, in the span of three verses, only in the span of three verses, he's on his deathbed and God gives him a sign. And in the second verse, he refuses to give God praise. And the scripture says that his heart became proud. It became proud. And then the Bible says that the wrath of God loomed over him and, his, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. But by the third verse, the Bible records that Hezekiah humbled himself. He humbled himself. And then the, in, that same, in that same verse, the Bible says that the wrath was removed. When you humble yourself, the wrath can be removed. When you, 
rid of the pride in your heart, the wrath can be removed. But pride comes when you have a lack of fear towards God. When you don't reverence him and you think that you do life all by yourself and you don't need, you don't need any help from God, that is called pride. I stand on this pulpit, Dan and I do peak worship, not by any of our own doings. It is only through the grace and mercy of God that we are standing here today and we can do this. But it's none of our doing. I don't want to have calamity. I don't want my days shortened. I have a fear of God. And I, I encourage you to read those scriptures. You need a fear of God in every area of your life, in your workplace, in your relationships, in your everyday doing when there aren't people around. When there aren't people around. See, God is a rewarder to those who are faithful when there aren't people around. He will reward you in, in, um, publicly if you're faithful to him privately. So only you know if you fear God. So I, I just think it's amazing that Hezekiah is a, an example of a man who had pride in his heart, but turned it around by humbling himself. And, and, and the Bible shows that there was wrath on him when he didn't humble. And then when he humbled himself, wrath was removed. So it, it's a good example and to parallel that Belshazzar did not do that. He didn't humble his heart. He didn't humble his life towards the Lord. And he experienced the wrath of God. So by the time that there is a writing on the wall for Belshazzar, Belshazzar I am more than sure, because God is a God of mercy, I am more than sure that he had plenty of opportunities to, to repent, to honor God, to choose right living, because that inscription was a death sentence. It wasn't a warning. And many of us sit here today where we've had opportunities to honor God. We've had, we've had opportunities to make the right choice. We've had the opportunity to choose blessing over cursing. The Bible says, choose, choose ye this day whom you will serve. Choose blessing or cursing. And it's like I tell my son, you know, obedience brings a blessing. Obedience brings a blessing. If you want to disobey mommy, then you don't get the blessing. I mean, it's as simple as that. We're God's children. He's telling us too. Alma, do you want obedience? I mean, do you want the blessing? Then you need to obey. It's as simple as that. Um, so I, I think that many of us, way before we get to that inscripted wall, we've had opportunities where God has had mercy and grace. Before we've signed the deed on a house, when we know we can't pay the mortgage, God has spoken to you. This is not for you. You cannot afford this mortgage. You cannot afford this car. You cannot afford this boat. You cannot afford this vacation that you're financing. God speaks to his people before he actually gives you a consequence. It'll be naive of us to think that he doesn't because the Bible says he's great in mercy. He's great in mercy. Um, God speaks to us before we do our taxes. You know, tax season already passed this year. And so um, I know it sounds very simple and basic, but believe it or not, there are thousands of people that cheat on their taxes. God speaks to you as you're doing your little your little E thing. God is speaking to you when you're filling in the zero dependence or five dependence. You have that inside of you already telling you. Um, God is speaking to you before you cheat on your spouse. It doesn't, you just don't cheat on your spouse. There are events occurring leading up to that, that God has given you a chance to repent. Just repent, turn around, this is not for you. You have a wife, turn around. Or you have a husband, turn around. God is being merciful in the events leading up to your consequence. Um, God is speaking to you before you get the promotion because maybe you lied to get the promotion. Maybe it's a lie that only you and your boss knows, but see, God knows. See, God knows. God knows if you're being faithful to him. Um, or even those are the people that say the little white lies. There aren't white lies. There aren't white lies. They're all lies. And the Bible says that a liar well, it's one of, the, one of the abominations that God speaks about. That he can't stand a mouth that speaks deceit. And I can't tell you where that's at right now, but it's in there. So read your Bible. <laughs> read your Bible. It's one of the abominations, a lying tongue. See, God is warning us and he's talking to us way before our consequence. You know, he could, he, sometimes before, before he, 
he, speak, he could speak through us through a billboard. Let's just say he, he'll give you a, a, a blatant sign on a billboard. He'll talk to you through a person. He'll write a message in the sky. He is capable of all of that. He is. God is God. He can do all of that. But sometimes God is speaking to us through that subtle knowing. There's that thing in that gut that says, mm -mm, you shouldn't be doing this. Everybody has it. Every person in this room has a subtle knower. It's called the Holy Spirit. You know what's right and you know what's wrong. And that leads me to my next point is that subtle knower comes from practicing a life of righteousness. That subtle knower comes from practicing a life of righteousness. Now, I'm not getting all legalistic on you where you got to be all, you know, Mother Teresa and all that. No, God knows your heart. This is a heart issue. God knows if you're living righteous before him to please men or to please God. That subtle knower comes from practicing a life of righteousness. And, and maybe we're practicing this, we're this life pleasing to God because I want the blessing. Joshua is going to do something right because he wants a brownie on the weekend. Joshua can only have um, um, dessert on the weekends. He can't have dessert during the week. Now, sometimes we're a little inconsistent with that. But for the most part, he knows that his weekends are, he can have YouTube kids and he can have desserts. But if he does something during the week, he will start taking away from that, uh, that weekend. He knows that. So it, it starts, he already knows. There's a, pra there's a practice already in place. See, when, when you practice a lifestyle of righteousness, I don't need a sticky note on my mirror saying, do not cheat on Dan today. Do not cheat on your taxes today. Do not lie today. Uh, do not harbor bitterness. Don't be offended. Don't be easily offended. Offenses are going to come. I don't need a sticky note on the wall to tell me or on my mirror to tell me that. Let me tell you why. Because when you practice a lifestyle of righteousness, that knower gets stronger. That impression of Holy Spirit tells you, this is not right. This is not right. So, so I don't need a blatant Writing on a billboard telling me that is something that you practice on a daily basis on, with your relationship with God because your relationship with God is a daily thing. It's not a Sunday thing. Right. Can, we, can we get that right? Can we understand that today? That your relationship with God is not a Sunday thing. It's not a Sunday thing. It's not a Wednesday thing. It is a daily thing. Your relationship with God is your everyday life. We're not promised tomorrow. None of us are promised tomorrow. Tomorrow is not promised. Your relationship is today. To get it right is today. You know, some of us in this room, um, God has dealt with us numerous times about our sloppy living. I'm not talking about not being OCD and leaving a bag of potato chips on, the, on your nightstand. I'm talking about being sloppy before the Lord and how you serve him and how you distrust him and how you, you only have, okay, we come to God with a mustard seed of faith. That's all we need. But sometimes we don't even believe the God that delivered us way back when that God can still do it today. See, God deals with us with those areas that become sloppy in a relationship with God. God's saying, God, I have delivered you over and over numerous times. And here you are with your sloppy thinking, thinking that I'm not going to do it for you. God is a God the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, many times... God is dealing us with our lying tongue. I already talked about the lying tongue. A spirit of control. You got to have control in that home. You got to have the last word with your husband. I think I was like that for a while, and, I, and the Lord really dealt with me. That is not right. Amen. It's an, it, it, we, we think, we think, <laughs> we think that we're, we're, we're winning, but God's like, that is just not pleasing in my eyes. That's not pleasing in my eyes. A prideful heart. When we slander our brethren, when we, sp when we speak negative about our brothers and our sisters, um, bitterness in our heart. God is dealing with us about the bitterness in our heart. There is, there is a scale. There is a time where we initially, let's just say we're hurt, and we, I, you say, God, I've been hurt. And this is real. I'm human. I'm hurt. But there is no reason why you're still fighting the bitterness of 10 years, 10 years later. That means there needs to be some kind of growth in you. You got to seek this word out because there's deliverance for bitterness. There is deliverance for unforgiveness. There is deliverance for offense. You don't have to live in that. And many of us, God is dealing with us in that area. 
Um, the lack of belief, I think I already covered that. We're so quick to just bow down and we, that God can do it. God can do it. Or the inability to wait. God said, wait. And I'll give it to you in the Hebrew and the Greek. Wait means wait. That is the same definition. Wait means wait. If God says, do not get that house yet, just wait. If God says, do not get that car yet, just wait. If God says, that man is not for you, just wait. If that woman is not for you and God says, wait, you wait. You wait till God says, go. Until then, then you just wait. Wait on the Lord. There's a scripture about waiting on the Lord. I'm not making this up. You just wait. You just wait. So I don't want us to get to that point where we finally get to the inscription on the wall like Belshazzar did. I don't wish that for any of us in this room that we have come to the fork in the road and God says, there is no fork anymore. It's not choose blessing or cursing. This is your curse. This is your consequence. This is the direction I'm taking you because you have dishonored me and you have lived unrighteously and you have not heeded my voice. You have not heeded history. You haven't seen what happened to you, what was happened to your ancestors. You're not heeding that. And we don't have to wait for the writing on the wall. You know, I want, I want a, a life that pleases God. I desire that you live a life that pleases God. And secret, in secret and, and in public. And in public. Um, I desire that you have righteous living ingrained in your soul. It's going to start today for my son. At four years old. I mean, it started a few years ago. But it's going to start at, at a young age to ingrain a, a life of, of, of righteous living. I can't start that at 15. Mind you, there are people that have just come to know the Lord, have just come to know Christ, and there's going to be some resistance, but you're going to believe God for the new revelation and believe God for your children in the name of Jesus because God is a redeemer of time. God is a redeemer of time. So if you're in this place and you think there is no hope for your children because you just came to know this truth, let me tell you that the devil is a liar and he wants you to believe that. If you are saved and you have just come to know Christ in the short time frame and you desire an abundant life like the word says for your children, you start praying without a shadow of a doubt, believing that God is going to fulfill that. It may not happen next week. It may not happen tomorrow. But God is going to do that because God has revealed to you, remove the scales off your eyes to pray the prayer of faith over your children. There is hope for redemption. Um, so I pray that, that, that there is a, a life of righteousness ingrained in your soul because I want the blessing of God and because I love him and because I love God. I know we all love God in this place. So we want to be impactful to the people around us. Live right. Be the example that God has called us to be. Um, see, God is merciful and he disciplines us in his kindness, but the Lord's patience will run out eventually. I know it's hard for people to hear this, that his patience runs out eventually, but the message in Romans says, I love it. I love the message Bible. It says, you didn't think, did you, that just by pointing your finger at others, you would distract God from seeing all your misdoings and from coming down on your heart? Or did you think that because he's such a nice God, he'd let you off the hook? Better think this one through from the beginning. God is kind, but he's not soft. In kindness, he takes us firmly by the hand and leads us into a radical life change. I love this. In kindness, he takes us firmly by the hand and he leads us. When I am leading my child to barely walk, I'm leading him into radical life change because I don't need him, you know, doing this at 25 years old. That's the radical life change I'm leading into to walk like a man. I mean, I'm not going to walk like a man. Dan's going to walk like a man. But you know what I mean. Use his good two feet. But he leads us with a firm hand. He's gentle, but he's firm. You're not getting by with anything. Every refusal and, and avoidance of God adds fuel to the fire. Every refusal. The day is coming when it's going to blaze hot and high. God's fiery and righteous judgment. Make no mistake. In the end, you will get what's coming to you. Real life for those who work on God's side. But to those who insist on getting their own way and take the path of least resistance, fire. Fire. We don't talk about hell a lot. We don't talk about the... The, the, the worm that never dies, the flame that's never quenched. We don't talk about that enough. There's a real eternity when you leave this earth. Yes, there is. And, and it matters what you do on this earth. That's right. That's right. 
Whether you love God with all your heart, whether you dishonor him or you, or you honor him with all your substance, everything, it, it matters. And there's a consequence at the end of this life. We're going we're to be held accountable for every word that's uttered out of this mouth, for every action that we do. The Bible says that. I don't say that. So no, doubt, no darts towards me. It's the Bible that says that. And I know that God deals with us before we, we get that consequence. I know he does. None of us are exempt from that because God loves his people. He says he's merciful and he's graceful. So he deals with us leading up to our consequence. And I don't want to wait for the death sentence to be written on the wall. I don't want to wait for an embodied hand inscripted telling me this is your death sentence. And I want you to know this morning that um, God, this, this embodied hand that we, saw, that we saw on the wall was not God's first time writing with his hand. I don't know if you know that. If you read your Bibles, you're going to know that. If you don't know that, you need to read your Bible some more. In Exodus 31, 18, the Bible says, when he finished speaking with him out on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of testimony, slabs of stone written with the finger of God. See, this was God's second time writing with his finger on, the, on, on something. Here it was the commandments. He gave Moses a slab of stone that he wrote with his finger. And I've looked at commentaries that says this was literal. This was literal. He used his hand to write on a stone. And it was literal the day that Belshazzar saw his death sentence. Only two times. And I think it's very significant when he does things because there, there is meaning. There, there's power behind it. And, and we should be alarmed by it. But we don't really need a writing on the wall this day. We don't really need a writing on the wall. You know why? Because we have this book right here. We have this book right here. This book teaches us. It warns us. It instructs us. It, it warns us. It warns us before we get to our consequence. It teaches us how to do righteous living. It teaches you everything under the sun. If you have an addiction, it'll teach you what you do. If you have pride, it'll tell you how to unpride yourself. That's not a word. But it'll tell you how to not get pride. If you have hate in your heart, it will teach you how to have love for your brethren. If you have um, a mental disease, it will teach you what to do to overcome the sickness. See, Josh, Joshua, I talk about Joshua a lot because he's our son and he's four. And that's the greatest thing happening in, my life, in our lives right now. Um, but when he disrespects me, and we're, he's four, so he's disrespecting me. As cute as he is, he is a little stinker. He tries me to, he tries both of us, but more me. When he disrespects me, he doesn't disrespect me because he didn't know what to do. See, he disrespects me because he knows what to do, but he wants to do what he wants to do. He doesn't want to do what he knows to do. He wants to do what he wants to do. And see, when I'm having a conversation, we've taught him, when I'm having a conversation with someone and he interrupts without saying, excuse me, I say, hold on a minute, you need to make that right. Use your manners, make it right. So what I do, I go and have a conversation and he has to do it all over again. And I say, yes, Joshua. And so I respond to him, we replay it again. If he yells at me, I say, oh no, sir, you better make this right. If he's rude to me, I say, uh-uh. We don't speak rudely. Well, you better make it right. I tell him, you better make it right. And he is being ingrained to make it right. Turn around and make it right. You not only have to apologize, you need to turn around and make it right. Many of us in this room today, we need to make it right. We need to make it right before God. God is saying, mm -mm, you didn't use common sense, but you didn't use the word of God in this situation. And I need you to make it right. I need you to make it right. See, Hezekiah, I love Hezekiah because in the, in, the, in the time frame of three verses, verse one, God spoke to him. Verse two, he had pride. Verse three, he, he became humble and God removed the wrath. Today, you can remove the wrath if you make it right. You can remove the wrath and make it right in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, you can make it right. 
I want you to picture God telling you, "Uh uh-uh, make it right. Make it right. Do what you got to do to make it right. Because I don't want to visit you on an inscripted wall with your death sentence. I don't want to visit you. That's not a warning. That is a death sentence. So make it right now. We have opportunity today to make it right. This is Pastor Daniel. I hope the message has touched you and I hope that, you know what, Holy Spirit's there tugging on your heartstrings and I'm hoping that you are willing to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I know for me, it was a young child that I gave my heart to the Lord, but then then I didn't live uh, my relationship for the Lord. I lived my relationship through my parents for the Lord. And then there was a time in my life where things just went wrong and went bad and, and the Holy Spirit was tugging at my heart and saying, hey, look, you know what? It's time. And I got on my knees. I cried out to the Lord and I made Jesus my Lord and Savior. And that was my relationship with him. And I know he's calling you right now into a relationship. And I just want to give you an opportunity to just enter in and give Jesus Christ your life and receive him as your Lord and Savior. It's this simple. All you have to do is close your eyes and bow your head and say, dear Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart and change my life. And I surrender my will to you in Jesus' name. If you've said that prayer, I'm telling you, you are saved. You are on the way to heaven. And he just wants you to live according to his word. So get into a church, start serving, get into the word of God and make a difference in your life. Hopefully you received a word from the Lord today. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, be sure to email us at admin at peak worship so that we can stay in contact with you. We want to make sure that you get plugged into a church in your area and we'll see you next time.